Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it is time for the Monday Q&As. So let's get this started. First question. Clicking knees, should I keep squatting and deadlifting? I must mention I have no pain with the clicking and crunching from my knees. Thanks in advance. Your knees are crunching? That doesn't sound good. Okay, clicking and crunching, the majority of the time this is not a problem. It is probably just fluid in your knees and connective tissue. You guys hear me when I'm doing uh, squats, sometimes when I'm doing like the instructional video I did with that high quality mic on the squat demonstration that my knees click on every single rep and make a popping sound. It is probably just fluid, particularly if you're not getting any like pain or sharp pains or, or anything like that, nothing painful, it's probably nothing. However, if it persists and you want to get it checked out, you could go in, have your doctor do an MRI just to give you some peace of mind and make sure, because there's a small chance there could be an issue there. But when there's no pain involved and you don't have any previous sports injuries or, or injuries from accidents that could be contributing to that, odds are it's nothing more than fluid. All right, next question. What is the proper way to ramp up to a one rep max? Honestly, when you're trying to ramp up to a one rep max, you need to do lots of doubles and singles, and I would just gradually build up. Let's say, for example, you think that your one rep max is going to be right at 200 kilos. I would generally recommend several reps with an empty bar, then do a double with 60 kilos, another double with 100 kilos, double or a single with 140, maybe a single with 160, 180, then 200, something like that. Or even if you, you're feeling like the 200 might be really close, go to 190, see if that is your training max or not, and if it feels okay, go to the 200. If the 200 still feels like there's more in the tank and you're wanting to do a, a true training max and it goes up really fast, then maybe bump it up five more kilos after that, or even two and a half, so 202 and a half or 205, if you think that that will be your, your better training max. Pretty straightforward. Again, keep those reps really low so you're not fatiguing yourself and you're just priming your nervous system for, for the weight to get heavier and heavier with just singles. Not that complicated to ramp up to a max. All right, next question. Hey Jason, you stated that a drug-free lifter should cut slowly, but later said that you recommend drug-free lifters to recomposition. My question is which method would be best for maintaining strength and muscle while losing fat for drug-free lifters. Okay, this is where it gets complicated because I've said different statements about lifters, drug-free lifters, people who lift in general, and I made statements about drug-free power lifters, which is a specific competitive sport with weight classes. Let's break that down. Drug-free lifters, people who lift weights, who don't use drugs, and anabolic drugs of any type, should cut slowly when they need to cut in order to maintain strength and muscle mass. Otherwise, they tend to lose strength and muscle mass. Not desirable. The reason I said power lifters should recomp, because unless you know for a fact you want to drop a weight class, you probably shouldn't be cutting very often as a power lifter, unless you're obese or you want to cut a weight class. Otherwise, what most novice power lifters should be doing, what I would have most of them do, is do a clean bulk till they come up to a certain weight when they get close to the top of a weight class then recomposition until they get as lean as they would like to be while staying in that weight class. Once they've gotten leaner, stayed near the top of the weight class and they feel that they are strong enough to move up to the next class, I recommend that they do a clean bulk and then recomp again. So unless they want to drop a weight class, they really shouldn't be cutting. Whereas in drug-free lifters have a variety of reasons why they might want to cut people who just lift who aren't competitive and aren't trying to stay within a, a peak level within their weight class can still cut and if they do so they just need to go more slowly so I needed to clarify that and understand that I was saying two different things when I said drug-free lifters I meant people who lift and power lifters I meant people who compete in power lifting which is a weight class based strength sport that I compete in so so that's the difference of why there was some confusion there so hopefully that clarifies that difference all right, next question. Pinlay row or dumbbell row, weighing them against their carryover to deadlifts. Okay, 
the dumbbell row is really just an overall better mass builder that doesn't build explosiveness or uh, development throughout the entire body the way that the Pendlay row does. And uh, the dumbbell row is an all around good or decent hypertrophy movement, but it's not training you specifically to improve at the deadlift unless you happen to feel that the primary movers involved with the dumbbell row, like the lats and rhomboids and maybe traps, are a weak link in your deadlift. The pen lay row, on the other hand, is a very explosive movement starting off the floor that involves a little more of the posterior chain, of course, than the, the one-arm dumbbell row does. And because it trains explosiveness as well as uh, utilizing the posterior chain and the core to a larger extent, it is going to carry over better to your deadlift. So if you're, you're doing some sort of row specifically as an accessory movement for your deadlift, think the Penlay row is going to be the hands down winner. No question on that one for those reasons stated, and particularly the explosiveness off the floor that it gives you. All right, next question. What's the best powerlifting program for intermediates to maintain strength whilst cutting? I am not currently eating a calorie deficit, but in a couple of months I will begin doing so to make weight at a meet. I am currently doing Mad Cow Bill Star Intermediate 5x5. Okay, now under normal circumstances, I would tell you whatever program helped you build your strength and your size to begin with, the same program will help you keep your strength and your size when you go into a cut. However, you won't be able to utilize the progression pattern. So if you went with the Mad Cow's 5x5, which is Bill Star's program, which is a good program, very time proven strength program, then run that same program but keep in mind with the calorie deficit you may not be able to increase your strength any longer as an intermediate or very minimally so you might have to scale back the progression on it quite a bit or even drop the progression to nothing and just maintain strength but at the very least you're going to have to cut the progression back because you're not going to gain strength easily in a calorie deficit now that would be true of any program that you ran that if you just continued it when you go into your calorie deficit and you're cutting. However, as you were trying to make weight specifically for meat, you might want to utilize some sort of peaking program. So for example, you're doing that five by five and doing those five rep sets, that's not a good idea going into a meat. So if you're going to slow cut into your meat, you might want to pick some sort of program that you utilize that brings you down to doing singles and doubles. You might want to use some sort of specific peaking program. There's a lot of them out there. You could write your own. I even like some sort of Bulgarian type training potentially to do that. That's what I personally utilize. When I am trying to trim down a little bit as I'm getting closer to means I drop down and start hitting just daily training maxes. So you can get used to that skill of hitting singles and hitting training maxes because you're not training those maxes specifically with a program like MadCal. So you're not getting better at that specific skill. It is more of a general strength and size program, but it's not preparing you to really peak your one rep maxes. So that's something that you would need to consider as a program going into the meet, even if you're in a deficit. Uh, it teaches you to, to train that skill for hitting singles. Even if you're not going to get particularly stronger in terms of actual hypertrophy or percentages of your one rep max off your training numbers due to the deficit, you still got to start practicing singles. All right, next question. How to fix imbalances between posterior chain and weak quads. My squat is embarrassingly weak as a result. Yep, one of those guys who can deadlift a ton and you can't squat. Okay, the, the situation there is that you need to put less focus on your posterior core movements and more focus on your squats. You could scale your deadlifts back just slightly or scale back any deadlift accessories you're doing slightly and replace that with additional squat volume. If you're squatting once a week and the squat is the weak link out of your movements compared to the deadlift, then squat twice a week. If you're squatting twice a week, consider squatting three times a week. If you're already squatting three times a week, consider adding more sets. You need to start adding more squat volume and frequency into your training to prioritize it over your deadlift if it really is lagging far behind and it's a weak link for you. That is the only way you're going to fix this because it could be a quad weakness or it could just be an overall skill weakness on the squat versus the deadlift. But either way, you're simply going to have to do more squatting in order to correct that. It's pretty straightforward. It's as simple as that. 
All right, next question. Jason, what are the, some of the differences someone who is hypogonadal and on a doctor advised TRT has compared to someone natty? Are there dietary strategies they can utilize or take linear progression further slash faster? Oh yeah, if you're on TRT at a replacement dose, there's plenty of data out there. I've linked studies in the past showing this that you can build muscle a little faster. You recover a little faster than someone who's producing their own amounts. There's a lot of reasons for this. Primarily the fact that they're measuring you once a week and seeing where your kind of your peak is on that scale usually quite a few days after your shot when it's really peaking at one to two days. So your overall weekly levels versus say just an AM check of your day to day, your weekly levels throughout the week totaled are going to be higher on the TRT if they're getting the, the two test measurements in a similar range. So accordingly what's going to happen is you simply have more stable and more total anabolic hormones in your system rather than dealing with those daily fluctuations. Now what this also does for you is that you have less need for things like dietary cholesterol and dietary fat which are less anabolic anyway so you can actually drop your dietary fat lower other than your essential fats you don't need to worry about things like uh, any sort of dietary fat in terms of testosterone and androgen production because you're putting it in your body synthetically on a prescription so you can drop fat lower you can boost carbs higher you can gain muscle slightly faster so essentially it's going to allow you better body recomposition and better overall nutrient partitioning is it going to be dramatically better no is it going to be better than any supplement that you could buy over the counter that isn't a drug, an anabolic drug itself? Yes, it will be better. So it's going to be very noticeable over the grand scheme of things. It won't be super dramatic. You're not going to get double the results, but it should be enough that you can measure and notice compared to, say, when you were producing normal levels before the prescription, before you had whatever issue gave you your hypogonadism. So clear benefits there in terms of overall not needing dietary help in producing testosterone, uh, allowing yourself to manipulate things like carb to fat ratios better and just overall better nutrient partitioning. You're going to see benefits from it. All right, next question. How do you feel about the double standard when it comes to strength? I've noticed most people expect semi-serious lifters to deadlift four plates. If you don't, you are considered relatively weak. On the other hand, when a certain celebrity who is Jack, uh, you Jackman, Deadlifts a similar weight, people call him out on extreme strength, brutal strength, steroids, etc. What I'm saying is, do you agree that the double standards exist in the training world? Yeah, the double standard exists, but you got to remember most of these double standards are keyboard warriors. For example, you look around on the internet, take me for example. I don't consider myself a strong guy. I mean, I'm okay. I, I don't brag about it. I don't think I'm particularly impressive. However, compared to the average power lifter, if you look at how I place at Meeks, you go around and look at different states in the U.S. and look at the numbers guys are hitting in their weight classes. Uh, look how people place at big events all over the world and compare in the same division, which means no wraps, no sleeves, nothing like that. Look at age, body weight. I'm way, way above average. In fact, there's quite a few states in the U.S. where I could break the state records pretty easily right now for multiple federations, including big federations. But you go to the internet and the standard is that I am really weak or I'm terribly weak for my, my body weight, that I'm really weak for someone who competes in powerlifting, but I'm pretty far above average. There are guys who are so much better than me, though, that top 1 to 2 percent is so much better than me that it makes me look like a weak little pathetic girl. Right? I, I agree with that's why I don't brag about my strength because I know there are guys that would just blow me out of the water that I, I not even I'm like three levels below them. But by competitive standards, I'm pretty good. But the internet calls people out on that. But then when you see these celebrities, people will do that because they are celebrities. And what you've got to remember is that you've got the internet culture which likes to drag everybody down and make fun of them. They don't want to look like a hater by making fun of celebrities, so they don't really chime in on true celebrities, so they don't get the hater tag. And then people who, who don't have a lot of experience around lifting or that culture will tend to jump up and say, oh my God, that guy's so strong, because let's be realistic, by normal gym standards, you Jackman is pretty strong. When you go to most gyms, and I hate to say it, it's sad because most people could very well be hitting those numbers inside of a year on a good program. 
But the truth is not that many people deadlift or squat or hit the big lifts that hard or heavy at most commercial gyms. So by commercial gym standards, anybody who's deadlifting 400 pounds throwing it around on a deadlift is considered well above average in a gym as far as regular gym goers go. So that's why you, you kind of get that, is that you have the whole internet net phenomenon of wanting to just drag everybody down who isn't the best of the best in the world. And in fact, sometimes they do that to them. They the same people not wanting to look like a hater with true celebrities because they'll get called out for being haters if they call them out. So they get quiet and then the people who see the less impressive standards in day-to-day -day gyms then see it and go, wow, that's, that's a lot better than I see at my local gym. So that's why you have that standard. It's slightly different demographics of people commenting. All right, guys, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.